talk is going to be uh, an overview of my uh, uh, work over the past few years in Northeast Scotland. And I hope that it will demonstrate uh, that crown odds are more numerous in Eastern Scotland than perhaps previously recognized. Uh, and that's uh, if we want to uh, have a broad understanding of uh, artificial life dwelling in the country, we need to really expand the geographical net that we cast uh, in, in our investigations. And so this is a, a distribution map of crown odds in Scotland, and, and the area I focus on is, is shaded in green there. Um, and as you can see, there are uh, uh, not very many crown uh, in that shaded green area. Um, so the, the main research questions that, that sort of have been guiding this work is, is what is that crown resource? Why are there some but not uh, uh, loads um, like you get in other places? Um, you know, if, if, if this is an Atlantic or Western uh, site type, um, you know, why do you get them at all in Eastern Scotland? Um, and then, of course, once we do have a data set of, of what's going on with crown in Eastern Scotland, how does that then relate to the rest of the, the, the phenomenon? Uh, what we do know about uh, crown in Northeast Scotland come from uh, some pretty minor antiquarian work. Two, two sites here, one of these on the top left there was excavated in 1850 by the local landowner, um, and uh, St. Margaret's Inch excavated by, by John Stewart in, in the 1860s, um, both after programs of drainage and lowering. Um, unfortunately, the, the records of these excavations are not particularly extensive. It's, it's very minor, uh, but what was uh, found does seem to be mostly medieval in date. Um, so these are, uh, are all the excavated crowns uh, in Scotland uh, with the date of last excavation plotted next to it. Um, and, and as you can see, the Eastern Scotland is, is largely barren from, from the 1860s. Um, and I've, I've highlighted two areas, Presbyterian and Decreasing Gallery, uh, Decreasing Gallery, which have really seen the majority of uh, the past 20 to 30 years of, of investigations. Um, and uh, we can see this again in, in, in sites that have been radiocarbon dated. Um, and this, is, this has led to, uh, I think, research strategies and wide perceptions and, and uh, a couple of interpretations uh, of crown based on this distribution and based on working in areas that there is data for. Um, and that's absolutely fine. However, there's been no systematic account of, of crown in Eastern Scotland to sort of control for, for those, uh, those ideas and particularly for future research strategies which have continually focused on these, these particular areas. Um, and the uh, especially important element of this is how uh, drainage fits into the picture. Walk drainage in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, was uh, a, a, a very pervasive thing throughout Scotland. And in fact, it, it is the reason why a lot of that antiquarian work got done was because of drainage. Um, so the first thing uh, that I took upon myself and my PhD was to, to account for that drainage and how it's impacted the crown resource in eastern Scotland as well as the rest of the country. Um, and the method was very simple conceptually. I used the Roy Military Survey Map, which was produced in the middle of the 18th century. Um, and it's freely available on the National Library of Scotland's website. Um, and I simply clicked through and found the locks. Uh, there are 1,796 of them. Um, I then tracked this through to the first edition of the Ordnance Survey. Um, and find these areas. You can see this particular lock is, is drained here. Um, and then looked at it again uh, in the present day using Google Images, uh, Modern Ordnance Survey, uh, and the like. Um, and with many of these locks, we can actually uh, go one step further and actually determine roughly uh, where the uh, uh, former lock was using historical accounts, using digital terrain model, and using the archaeological record itself. It's, it's interesting to note, uh, this particular lock is, is, is now an area of very fertile land, but there's not a single reported archaeological site within that orange ring, uh, that orange uh, uh, line, which is at about 145 meters uh, above sea level, uh, with one exception, which I will come back to uh, in a bit. Um, so rolling out this methodology across the country, this is the map you end up with. This is uh, uh, those locks uh, 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 displayed by whether they were not changed at all, lowered, drained, or dammed uh, in the first edition, so the middle of the 19th century here, compared to the Roy map, um, and then again uh, compared to the present state. Uh, and this allowed some, some uh, patterns to be observed and some analysis to be done. Uh, and roughly what I ended up with was three uh, main regions. The blue region, northern and central Scotland, there's not much drainage going on at all, um, uh, very little. Uh, most of the impacts to locks seems to be damming in the 20th century. Uh, the green and the orange, eastern Scotland and southwest Scotland, uh, have broadly similar rates of drainage, uh, between sort of 40 and 80 percent, depending on which little area you look at. Um, uh, 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 but crucially, the difference between the two is the timing that the drainage is taking place. 
Uh, in eastern Scotland, drainage is taking place somewhat earlier, uh, and in southwest Scotland, it's taking place somewhat later. And so the hypothesis is then, um, uh, we can look at this graphically first, um, and you can see uh, uh, the, um, the amount of change in eastern Scotland versus the amount of change in southwest Scotland, and also the intensity of drainage, much more completely drained versus lowered, whereas here it's much, e much more even. Um, and then we can look at this below uh, 200 meters uh, ordinance datum, where you're gonna have the most intense agricultural activity, and again, a similar kind of pattern uh, emerges. Um, so the hypothesis is then that uh, perhaps the reason why we get so many more crinogs in southwest Scotland compared to eastern Scotland, areas that saw a lot of drainage, is the fact that that earlier drainage was taking place before there were antiquarians around the country to notice these sites coming up. Uh, before there was just a general awareness of what archaeology was. The 18th century, uh, there's a lot of awareness of what artifacts and shiny materials are, but not a lot of awareness of what uh, a settlement uh, might look like in the past. Um, and in fact, I think there's good evidence to suggest that these sites were actually being targeted as, as sources of raw material, whereas in the second half of the 19th century, people recognized these as lake dwellings, as artificial islands, uh, to a much greater extent. Um, and I'll take you through an example of, of how this impacted uh, that distribution map and how that's impacted our, our research strategies. Uh, this is Loch Oren Fife, uh, and you can clearly see an island with a, a building depicted on it. Um, and this is it today, um, still standing. Um, but in the Canmore record, this site is recorded as a castle and possible moth. Um, it is not a possible moth, uh, it couldn't have been. Um, but I think because that lot was drained at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the Ordnance Survey comes by uh, at the end of the 19th century, they don't recognize it for what it probably was, which is a castle on an island, and it's probably artificial. Um, and I've reconstructed the, the former shoreline here, uh, and it clearly shows Loch Orr Castle in the eastern portion of the loch there. Um, the loch was, was totally drained in the 19th century, then much later reinstated in, in the early 20th century. Um, and rolling this out again across the country, uh, I've now compiled a list of about 80 sites, um, possible crinogs, uh, on the basis that uh, uh, they are recorded in the Canmore database, uh, and they are possibly, probably, or definitely within former locks. And their site description in the Canmore database fits roughly uh, uh, what I'd expect from a crinog in a drained context, a mound of X dimensions, uh, and so forth. Um, a note on this, I do expect some of these crosses to have to come off. Um, I also expect a number uh, of possible sites to go on. Um, and in addition to that, we also have to keep in mind that uh, in areas of, of intense drainage, they're trying to improve the land, and I think a lot of sites have just been completely removed, and, and identifying them is, is going to be uh, uh, nearly impossible. But it's not enough to just simply imply that uh, these are these are crowns. This hypothesis needs to be tested. Um, so returning to uh, the lock off Boston, which I just showed you, that one site that was the exception uh, uh, in terms of the archaeology recorded within that former lock is the Hauf. Uh, you can just see it uh, on the western end of the lock here. Um, and, and this site, uh, this site uh, is in sort of very fertile arable land today. Um, the field that it sits in is at about 142 meters of, above sea level, uh, which is about three meters uh, below where I suggest the former shoreline would have been. Um, it's recorded in Canmore in the Aberdeenshire SMR uh, as a burial ground and possible moth or medieval ringwork. Um, and it is indeed a burial ground. There is evidence for uh, 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 some mausoleum structures or some kind of burial structures on top. And this is historically recorded as being uh, uh, the burial ground of the Duguid family who lived in the local area and they buried uh, uh, their family members there in the uh, uh, 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so the first thing I did was to do a, a, a DGPS survey of, of the mound itself um, and the, uh, the surrounding fields to more confidently identify, so here's the mound, um, to more confidently identify uh, exactly its relationship to uh, the, the probable paleo shoreline uh, at 145 meters uh, uh, above sea level. Um, the top of the mound sits at about 146 meters above sea level, so it's, it's uh, about three and a half to four meters above uh, this oval-shaped rise uh, that you can see, um, which is at uh, 142 meters above sea level, uh, and so it, it rises up from that. And that's really its classic Cranoff building technique: is finding a sort of slightly <laughs> shallow area out into uh, uh, the loch and building uh, there. Um, and here's a simplified plan of the site: with the the large oval is the is the the natural rise and then the mound coming up. Um, 
And uh, very recently, uh, put in a trench in the northern end, you can see uh, the small rectangle, um, and these were the results. Um, you have a completely artificial mound. Um, below the topsoil is an organic rich uh, 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 sediment that has bits of charcoal within it. Um, unfortunately, because this site has been drained 300 years, it is now a soil. Um, there is zero uh, uh, organic elements that are the classic sign of a crinoid. However, that organic uh, sediment is sitting on a totally sterile gravelly sand, uh, which I think is consistent with, uh, with potentially a, a lack of shrine sediment. And within the, the organic rich black layer there, there were uh, lenses of less organic, um, uh, 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 slightly different color um, sediment uh, that I think is potentially um, uh, uh, lake mud that was uh, existing above the sand before the, the mound was, was built on top of it. Um, I do think there are some caveats here. I think uh, more work needs to be done. I'm hoping to have the results of some diatom analysis to establish if that uh, uh, organic rich layer was definitely laid down in uh, uh, lake conditions. Um, and then hopefully with a positive result there, we can uh, perhaps do soil micromorphology to see under the microscope if those classic timber elements of Karnak uh, are surviving. Um, so with those uh, minor reservations in mind, I think we can add the Hauf to uh, the map of excavated Karnak. Um, and that result, I think, is very important because it makes uh, landscapes like this uh, uh, rare surviving examples of, uh, of what would have been a landscape full of a lot more locks and probably full of a lot more crinogs in eastern Scotland. This is Prison Island in, in Loch Canord, and I've been doing some work uh, uh, there over the past few years. Um, and what uh, brought uh, attention to Loch Canord for me and uh, for a number of other people is the absolutely incredible archaeological landscape there. Uh, it has at least uh, three crinogs, a possible fourth. Um, uh, there's a, a, a range of artifacts that have been found out of this lock. Uh, an entire bridge was built over the River Dee with timber pulled up from the bottom of the lock in the 19th century. Uh, one of those timbers was saved by some brothers that, uh, that built it into their cottage and carved onto the timber <laughs> was the date 1113. Um, uh, of course, uh, the rolling glass bottle, very pretty. Uh, the royal yacht there, uh, when it was first found, you can see the, the sketch of it below. Uh, it's now just a tiny fragment held in Marshall College. We recently got a radio carbon date back on that, uh, 6th to 7th century AD. That is uh, uh, definitely a, a, a terminus post quem. I don't know where that chunk of wood came from the, the stem of the tree, uh, so we could be a good few hundred years out there, but it's definitely a, a, a sort of range finder. Um, in addition to that logboat, there were further three logboats found. In fact, the Royal Yacht was the smallest at about seven meters, the largest was nine meters. Um, uh, and then there was a clinker built vessel as well, recovered in the 19th century, part of a clinker built vessel. So, uh, a very active archaeological landscape and well, well deserving of, of research. Um, uh, and so, this is some of the results uh, of that submerged work I've been doing, uh, uh, just trying to, to plan the sites, uh, even just a basic plan, uh, and, and to get some, some radiocarbon dates. Uh, and those radiocarbon dates, for the moment, are totally medieval. Um, these are not Iron Age structures. I suspect there are earlier phases uh, that might push it back to the Iron Age, but I don't have that evidence at the moment, so they are medieval. Um, and they will remain such uh, until, until new evidence comes to light. Um, and as uh, Graham was demonstrating earlier, is we have to put these into, into their wider landscape context. Uh, and that's some of the work that I hope to, to do over the next 12 months is continue to, to go diving and look at the crinogs, but also to place them uh, within what's going on uh, uh, around the shores of the walk as well. Uh, Richard Bradley has plans for excavations in this area. There are uh, at least three suits rings, and I think he's going to be excavating one of them. Uh, uh, very exciting um, potential. I hope to confirm the existence of the walk down and crinog up there uh, in, in the coming months, as well as, as, as do more work. Um, but I'll focus now on the Guardi Bank Peninsula. Uh, this is another uh, inland water promontory fort that Graham spoke about um, uh, a few moments ago. And I think this is a class of site that has really been overlooked um, in terms of their significance and their frequency uh, uh, turning up in these inland water positions. Coastal promontory forts, very well understood, well, very well known. Um, uh, inland water promontory forts, much less so. Uh, so earlier this year, we undertook uh, some minor excavation with the aim of trying to uh, uh, date the construction of the earthworks into double bank and ditch construction. Uh, and uh, Loch Canord suffered some lowering of the water, and if you br bring the level of the water back up, uh, it very, very much isolates this peninsula uh, and these two uh, 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 ditches and banks. Um, and one of the things that uh, uh, I'm interested in exploring is this idea that um, crinogs uh, uh, are a part of an enclosure. If you think of the shore of the loch as an enclosure, uh, there are a lot of parallels that can be drawn 
uh, to hill forts, for example, uh, have become much much less uh, isolated in terms of our understanding of, of, uh, uh, of other um, settlement architectures. And uh, perhaps enclosing these promontory forts are like bringing uh, the peninsula into the uh, sphere of control of the crown, or perhaps vice versa. Um, unfortunately, that has to remain just a, a flight of fancy uh, because the excavation uncovered uh, a lot of disturbance. Um, the two banks and ditches appear to have been recut at some point. Um, unless somebody uh, can convince me that that uh, dry stone walling is, is Iron Age or, or early medieval, I suspect it's probably 19th century. Um, there was no charcoal or organic material from the fill of the ditch, uh, and that was both the outer and inner ditch. Um, in the inner uh, uh, bank, we went through the bank and we identified the former land surface on which the bank was built. We got uh, 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 organic, uh, some charred wood from that, uh, from that land surface. Unfortunately, that date came back Neolithic, so uh, it definitely postdates the Neolithic, but uh, uh, not much uh, uh, resolution there. Um, so if we just bring it back to, to the wider picture, um, I think if we want to understand artificial island dwellings, we need to, to look more widely. Focusing in on particular regions uh, is excellent and provides the fine-grained detail that we, uh, uh, that we all really like to see. But uh, artificial islands are a much broader phenomenon than just the few regions that we have good data sets for. Um, so that is uh, 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 what I'm working towards uh, uh, trying to develop, is being able to have a data set for crannons outside of those regions uh, uh, to hopefully illuminate more about uh, uh, crannons generally. Uh, so finally, uh, I'd like to thank a number of people. Um, uh, a lot of volunteers have, uh, have helped me to excavate and uh, to do the diving. I must thank them. Uh, I'd like to thank Bruce Mann in particular, who's here. He's supported this work from, from the word go. And uh, finally, thank you to the Society of Antiquaries uh, for providing some of the money to do this work. Thank you.